All right, we are live, Myth Vision Podcast. I'm the host of this channel called Myth Vision Podcast. My name is Derek Lambert, and I have our guest joining us today, Michael Jones, the legend, the myth, the historical person. I don't know which one it is, but he's joining us today. What's up, Michael? What's going on? Thanks for having me on. I've been wanting to have this conversation for a few months now. Dude, we, we, so for people who don't know, we do talk off air as well. Um, and so we're buddies. I like to think we're buddies, Michael. I mean, I, I really do see you as a friend. I know there's all sorts of beef and stuff that happens on the internet. But uh, this is his YouTube channel, Inspiring Philosophy. So if you're interested in going and subscribing and learning, but people from not your tribe, if you're someone of a skeptic and things like that, like me, go watch the work he's doing so you can at least engage and see the arguments that are coming up. It's not good to remain ignorant if you're going to engage in this material, my opinion. Um, we're going to be discussing, do dying and rising gods prove Jesus is a myth? This video, I'm hoping we can actually play it and go through some you're, of the material in there. Huh? Derek, j just before you get going, um, I noticed it too, but people in the chat are saying your connection is a little spotty. Uh, but And I thought it was maybe just me, but it seems like maybe you as well. It's other people are noticing it. Let me double check something real quick here. Okay. Yeah, it's really glitchy leaving. So anyway, now this is my channel that Derek has left. Okay, so first <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, I think I just have, I don't know. I've got a lot of stuff open right now, so I'm hoping that this computer can handle the jandal when it comes to this. Um, bear with me. Forgive my okay. internet. Uh, also, we have the Patreon. If you want to support what we're doing here at Myth Vision, you can join the Patreon and, of course, support what we're doing. Uh, we bring a lot of scholars on, and we're doing courses as well, all sorts of fun stuff, so help support us. And then also Michael Jones has a Patreon. For those of you who want to support what he's doing, you can do that there as well, and you release videos early and stuff and give people sneak peeks and private community sessions and all that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do that. I'm trying to do a little bit more interviews. I'm going to have Tom Holland on my channel tomorrow. I saw that. Mm -hmm. I saw that. Tom. Tom's actually an interesting guy. I'd love to have him on one day as well to discuss Islam I'll, and and other things. I'll mention but it to him and see what he says. Please do. Am I coming in really bad right now? Or you, is everybody catching me pretty good? Better now? I think you're doing better. Yeah, it's not glitchy anymore. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, do our intro, and then we're going to dive into the material. I'm interested in having a dialogue with Michael. I hope at the end of the day... Um, people can understand why we draw the conclusions we do. I'm not here to convince Michael. That's not my goal. Michael's not here to convince me. I'm not going to say we wouldn't love to see each other come to conclusions like that, but we're not here to debate and challenge that way. It's more of a discussion for you, the viewer, to understand why people draw their conclusions and let you decide for yourself. Let's do our intro now. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Yeah, I don't know why I have clothes on in the Matrix <laughs> pod, okay? 
I just, I don't know. I can't explain that, but we all have our own uh, mythology, right? And uh, <laughs> really appreciate you sitting through that one there, Michael. Um, and, and look, Dr. Josh is in the chat. Digital Hammurabi, I think the problem is that neither of you can ground ultimate instantiation of necessary preconditions of possible impossibilities. Boom, roasted. <laughs> Welcome to the chat, everybody. I see a lot of good, a lot of good people here in the chat. A lot of people checking us out, and some people are saying, "Hey, Derek, I thought you weren't a mythicist anymore," and I'm not. So technically, if we're going to be discussing the topic, and I need to pull that video up just to have it ready. Technically, do rising, dying, and rising gods prove Jesus is a myth? If we mean by myth that he doesn't exist, then no, I would agree with you that the this doesn't prove. Um, however, in the intro, I think it's worth playing. You do mm -hmm. say like it doesn't put a single dent. None of this does anything on the truth mm -hmm. of Christianity. It, it doesn't do anything. And so yep. I'm, you explain yourself in the video. You're kind of ha you'd have to repeat yourself because it's actually in your video. But I I have to disagree. I I think. But then again, this is where we're going to have a difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a trope and there's topos here of legend. Do you think that? Because it sounded like if we're granting, which I don't even think you grant that dying and rising gods is a category, but if no. we're granting that category, do you think that the Jesus story in some way, or even let's not grant it, let's just assume for a second, your personal opinion, do you think there's legend in the narrative of Jesus at all in the Gospels? It depends on what you mean by legend. Do right. I think that um, they can use like legendary themes to tell a story? Well, sure, they can do things like that. Like you could talk about John F. Kennedy in terms of Camelot. Could we say there's legendary aspects in JFK? Well, yes and no, nothing in the actual historical account. But you can make matches to certain things. So it depends on what you mean by that. Right. So let me... Um... Is there any account specifically, can you give me one example, maybe like the birth narrative or something where you think, hold on, I don't think it's describing exactly what happened. I think it may yeah. be working off of a trope. Are there any examples yeah. in the Gospels where you think that? Yeah, like Matthew, when he talks about the tombs opening of Jesus's uh, uh, death. Uh, that I think that's far more likely him basically saying it was like hell froze over. You know, it's not really saying that literally it's just using the common themes of the day to say this was such a catastrophic thing that happened. Would you maybe apply that to the birth narrative at all? No, because I do believe in the virgin birth. Right. So what about like just the narrative itself? Do you believe there are three or not three because it doesn't say three, but, you know, the, the trope that the wise men come from the east, the whole nine. Do you think that literally happened? Yeah, I think Magi visited Jesus later in his life after they had been in a house for a while in Bethlehem. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to figure out because in the video, it sounds like you're, you're willing to say maybe they're building it off of a previous trope. And I think they are, I think there's tropes. I think there's a common literary trope in the air for birth narratives. Um, even the idea of ascension and, and deification, you know, stories where there are even eyewitnesses in some of these, what you may say are legendary and don't believe. And I'm reading the same thing and I'm going, okay, it's not the identical story, but I'm reading it going, but this one is true. So let's talk about Titan and Titanic for a second. And I, I okay. love the analogy because I had never really looked into this before your video. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, snap. So I started looking at the comparisons and I'm really like, dang, 14 years before this guy writing futility, literally a lot of this stuff was pretty accurate. And some people thought he was, able to see the future and all of that good stuff. And they ask him and he's like, no, I just know what I'm talking about. Like my dad raised me on a boat. They were in the great lakes. And then he traveled the world on the oceans and things like that. So he knows about nautica or knots. Uh, he knows about ships. There are plenty of differences and plenty of things that kind of overlap. So he was trying to say like, I'm not a clairvoyant prophet or anything. Um, mm -hmm. I think that analogy falls apart in this example. And then okay. I'd love to have you respond to me on this. If we said that the Titanic sunk and we knew that this boat ended up on the bottom of the sea, 
And then three days later, this boat literally is floating on the ocean. It resurrects from the bottom of the ocean to floating on the sea. That would be like, are you kidding me? That's That would be an amazing account that I would go, okay, if we had other examples, then I would anchor it in reality and say, hey, this seems like stuff that happens. You see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah. So here's the problem with what you're you're doing here. This isn't the argument that was originally made. This is more of a Humean style argument against miracles. So the original argument was, as, as far as I was understanding it, was is that we have legends of dying and rising gods. Let's grant that. Mm -hmm. Right, Jesus right. was a dying and rising God. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's more likely it's a legend from these similarities. Uh, so my point was like that doesn't prove anything because there's so many other examples where history and myth can overlap or you can find similarities in fiction versus reality. This wouldn't prove anything. That's my point. And, and when you made your reply and as well as Atheologica, you kind of proved my point because you didn't defend that argument. You retreat. You kind of pivoted to a human style argument that this is just some sort of supernatural thing. It doesn't happen in reality. Therefore it's more likely legend, but okay. That that's an argument we can have, but that's not the argument that similarities alone would prove it's a legend. It's a pivot to a human style argument, but you can make the human style argument without the similarities. I mean, Carl Sagan did a human style argument at one point in with using a magical dragon in a garage kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So if the whole argument is just a human style argument against miracles, kind of proves my point that you don't these that just doing these comparisons and trying to find similarities would not well, prove this, whether something is legend or myth so so it, it goes further and and technically i'm trying to ask why aren't we granting romulus why aren't we granting alexander the great if we're going to open the door to saying let's not argue against miracles miracles are a go i'm going to grant miracles just like you're granting dying and rising gods why are we stopping at Jesus and not giving these pagan gods, Hercules, Asclepius, who zap, gets zapped by Zeus and is ascended? Why is that not true? Why didn't that actually happen? If we're going to open that door, there's I see no reason why we stop short of Jesus only and not recognize the other narratives or even grant. People believed Zeus and Ap Apollo or Hercules, the narratives of Hercules. They believed Osiris literally did these things. They believed in these things. And I'm saying, if we're opening that door, you would, I think, agree with me that those are legendary or mythological, that they're not historically, literally true, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, let me try to, I mean, yeah, I would say they're more legendary. I mean, but here, let me try to give you an example of why I don't think that's work, because that's not how evidence works. Let's say you and me are out for a walk and poof, Horus appears before us, mm -hmm. okay? He says... Look, listen, guys, there's a lot of myths going around there. I actually died and rose again 4,000 years ago in ancient Egypt. Now, here's some money. Poof, money comes into existence. You need to go to Egypt, find this tomb, and let's say we go find it. And we find, yes, it's empty. And on the wall, we were able to read hieroglyphics as well. Let's just say that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we see, yes, they people thought this. They actually believe this. We would not walk out of that tomb and go, aha, this is clear evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Because you judge these things on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. You don't go like, oh, yeah, well, you know, if we're going to grant one miracle, we're going to grant other miracles. If you told me you crossed the Alps with elephants, I'm not going to go, well, you know, Hannibal did it. So Derek probably did it as too. I'm going to be like, no, mm -hmm. give me your evidence for that case. Same with the moon landing. I mean, I'm not going to go, well, you know, we've got, you know, let's say we go to the moon in 20 years. And finally, the, you know, the, the anti moon landing people that think it was all a hoax agree, okay, we went to the moon. We're not going to go, okay, are you now going to believe the Neil Armstrong one? No, we're going to have to use evidence from that specific moon landing to show them, yeah, it actually happened. Look, the Russians picked up on the signal. We can see the mark still on the moon from this point if we look at the telescope. We're going to use evidence specific to that. We don't do this thing where we just uh, you know, open the floodgates if we prove one thing is true. That wouldn't work in a court of law. If you can prove like you know that uh, Jim murdered you know this guy, we're not going to say that clearly these other murders were also caused by him. So this just that's not how it just logically follows in any of the examples I can provide. So this this so bringing up this idea, we've opened up the floodgates and said all of this stuff is possible. I mean, I can't say it's not possible, um, but let's just grant these miracles are happening in the world. I'm saying, do you think that Christians who buy into the narrative of Jesus, Christianity, are able to look and go and actually see if these other myths and legends and such may be true? Or are they going at it like this can't be true? 
I mean, I guess it's a case by case basis by each individual who's investigating this because that how they're perceiving it, how they're going to look into it. But mm -hmm. I'm reading it going, why are we not saying that, that these things may have happened? I mean, we may not have some of the literature that was once there. We may not have some of the accounts that may have been eyewitness testimony or they claim to have been eyewitness testimony and such. We've probably lost a lot of documentation in history. So therefore, um, maybe we can't prove as much about Hercules, let's say, or one of the figures that people believe did certain things, whether they be miraculous or something you go, only a God could do that. Um, I don't, for me, I'm not understanding how, when we see all of these other tropes and other figures in history do things, whatever the thing may be, whether they die and then have an apotheosis and go into heaven and ascend like we see Jesus doing acts, how that doesn't lend credence to the idea that it's walking like a duck, it's talking like a duck, why that doesn't at least, at least put a dent in the direction of saying, hey, we really should consider this might be a duck. I mean, it may not be, but why aren't we thinking maybe this might be? You see what I'm saying? Okay, well, so again, I would use a bunch of my examples, but let me try to do this a different way. Uh, for one, as I said, I don't think that's how evidence works. This is a case by case basis, but let me try to get you out of your worldview because sometimes when we're in our own worldview, it's harder to see it. Let's talk about another worldview you and I both reject, young earth creationism. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the Meister footprint? No. Okay, so this is a thing that young earth creationists use. It's um, M-E-I-S-T-E-R, print. This guy was in the walking around and he found, he found a fossil. And it looks like two boot prints. Uh, mm -hmm. But one of the boot prints looks like it's stepping on a trilobite that went extinct, you know, hundreds of years ago. I've heard about this, ago. yeah. Yeah. Now, scientists evaluated this, and they were like, okay, this is not actually a boot print. It just looks like one. Uh, it, it's, it's clearly a trilobite that's been fossilized, but it's just – there's no way to look – if you look at the actual evidence for the prints, the pressure is wrong. It was not actually caused by a foot. Now, young earth creationists could be like, how could you reject that? It looks like a footprint. It walks like a footprint, no pun intended, and yet you're just rejecting it. You accept all these other things that look like footprints. Why were you going to reject this one? Because it's the evidence specific to the case. The scientists evaluated. They demonstrated that this clearly is not a footprint. I, we don't just do this opening the floodgate thing where we go, yes, we have other footprints. Clearly, this one has to be a footprint as well. And when we see young earth creationists arguing that way, you and I both are going to be like, that's <laughs> fallacious. That's not going to prove your point. When it comes to dying and rising gods, I'm not going to go, yes, if we have evidence of one miracle, therefore I have to believe in Hercules and Romulus and all these other ones. That's just not how evidence works in any other field of research. Why would it be applied here against Christianity? So what I'm, I guess maybe, maybe what I'm saying isn't quite coming across. I'm not saying that they did happen. I'm saying, do you think that the Christian who believes their stories are true are able to fairly go and examine and investigate and consider, I mean, these other people really believe these things about their gods. Yeah. They actually believed Asclepius really, in some cases, resurrected people from the dead, the same we see Jesus do. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, we may not have this documentation the same way we do with gospels and the New Testament is, per is preserved the way that it is. But I I'm like, there's so many things to, to cover here in my mind, but I'm thinking to myself, why not Asclepius? Why not say, well, maybe Asclepius did this, but he didn't do it by the power of God, Satan or something, or try to argue that maybe these people really did do some of this stuff. And we're just saying it wasn't our Jesus. It wasn't well, in our early sources. I mean, Asclepius re like resuscitated people with a plant he found that he got from watching two snakes. One you know, used the plant on another. Uh, here, here's my response to that. I don't see sufficient evidence to believe in those, and I can remain agnostic and just be skeptical until I get more evidence, the same you would do with some Christian claims. Right. Here, let me, give you, let me give you a different example that might be more uh, relatable. You know, uh, Islamic claims of miracles. So, like, for example, they'll say that Muhammad met an angel in a cave that they claimed with Gabriel. I can be agnostic and skeptical of that, but let's say you could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was. Okay, it's not really going to threaten my worldview because a lot of Christians today think that Gabriel, that, that an angel actually did meet Muhammad. It was just a fallen angel. I'm not convinced of that. I'm, right. I'm, 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 just, I'm just agnostic on it. I don't really know what got Islam going. I have different hypotheses I could throw out there, but it's not yeah. something I have to like, throw my hat in with. So when you bring up like Hercules and Asclepius, I'm like, okay, 
I can just be skeptical of those like you are. I don't see why I have to uh, threaten my worldview because I think we do have good sufficient evidence for Jesus's resurrection. Okay, question. Have you ever read Richard C. Miller? Because, oh, by mm. the way, let me mention one thing before we even continue. You're going to notice people viewing that we're going to have our little card of scholars. For example, um, Michael has, you know, some particular books here that he would say make cases for the resurrection of Jesus. And of course, I would imagine he would agree, not saying you agree with everything that is said in these books, but there are arguments in here that I suspect that convince you and, and help you argue. Myth Vision has scholars as well. And this is the thing is like tit for tat, different academics. It's important that we, if we're going to take this serious, at least know what N.T. Wright is saying, for example, or Richard Bauckham, what he does with eyewitnesses. We should know what Michael Lacona is saying if we're going to engage. And I think mm -hmm. the same should be on the, on the other side as well. And I must admit up front, I have not read all of this material. I have started reading Jesus and eyewitnesses. Um, but have you read Jeffrey Tripp? No, no. Uh, just let me stop the, the share for the for the so that it's not the sound share, but I do want to show you Jeffrey Tripp, right? So he's someone, what did I do? Oh, here we are. He's someone who wrote this here, direct internal quotation in the Gospel of John, and he actually takes a critical approach to Bauckham's eyewitness stuff, showing how the Gospel of Mark or Gospel of John, I'm sorry, isn't eyewitness. So it's like there's tit for tat, right? Like you'll quote a scholar, mm -hmm. I'll quote a scholar, we'll have a scholar, you'll bring up Medinger, and then I'll bring up this guy, and we'll show dying and rising gods, or this guy thinks there's something there, this guy doesn't think this, and vice versa. And it'll go on and on and on. And I hope that people who are watching this will take the time to read both sides. But I asked if you if you've read this particular book by Richard C. Miller. Oh, let it. me see the book. Hold on. Can you see me? Hold on. Kind of is blurry, but yeah, I Richard, see it now. I just started this, and this is a really good read. He gets into Justin Martyr, and he's mm -hmm. showing that that famous apology where he compares, in a way, what is going on with the other figures, just like these other figures and stuff, and um. He goes through the arguments of how people are interpreting that. And he's showing like he is comparing this Jesus narrative, but of course saying this one is the true, this is the truth, this one is right. Um, I hope that people watching will take the time to actually consider reading this material. But what is your thoughts about Justin Martyr making that statement? So here's the thing about Justin Martyr that I don't get why he's used so much. Is that he is clearly pleading for his life in this letter. Mm -hmm. He makes a lot of analogies. He's like, you know, he's like you, for example, he's like, you call us atheists, but you don't kill these philosophers who also call themselves atheists. Why are you persecuting us? Mm -hmm. Then he goes into the, the whole pagan co connection. He's like, look, you, you claim to worship sons of God. Well, we claim to worship a son of God. Why are you not persecuting the people that worship Dionysus or Hercules? This is not in my view, in his attempt to say, yes, this is historically the case of what's sort of happening because he develops it even more. But he's just saying, look, please don't murder us for the please. If you're going to if you're not, please just look at us the way you look at people who worship Hercules or these atheist philosophers. Don't murder us because then he goes on to argue that like demons had sort of like try to imitate the Old Testament in some ways to make these legends. But mm -hmm. he then says they weren't really good at it. They, they messed up constantly and got a lot of things wrong in their attempts to sort of like try to like work with what Moses was saying and try to predict the future. So I think in context, what he's doing is he's not trying to like do like, you know, an historical case to try to show Jesus comparisons with Dionysus. He's saying, look, mm -hmm. please don't murder us. Fortunately, he, you know, that's why we call him Justin Martyr because he did get martyred, but he's trying to say like, we just want to live. Like, please let us live. Yeah. And so I guess we're reading that in, we have a lot of overlap. I agree with you that the guy's pleading for, Hey, why me? Why are you picking on us? But I definitely think that he is trying to – I think that Christianity is built in the furniture of the rest of the Mediterranean world where you have these tropes. You have these different myths. Um, I was talking to Richard Miller, the author of this book, yesterday, and he mentions in the final sentence of that Justin quote in chapter one, the apology points to the eyewitness uh, tradition as part of the nothing new claim. In other words, 1 Corinthians, according to Justin, is just more of the nothing new pattern applied in, in early Christian tales of Christian hero. And what about the emperors who die among you, whom you deem worthy to be forever immortalized, and for whom you bring forward someone who swears to have seen Caesar, once having been consumed by fire, ascend into heaven from the funerary prior mm -hmm. fear? Now, of course, they even had people they paid to come and act like testimony. And, oh, we, 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 uh, we did see him. Uh, hand me those shekels. But 
uh, it, 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 I see this trope and I can't help but thinking, hey, there's something going on where this sounds like it has some legend in it, at least. At the very least, it sounds legendary. So, all right, we're Suetonius, right? The Divine mm -hmm. Augustus. And this is on page 90. If anybody hasn't read this particular translation, which is uh, by Catherine Edwards, here is the birth narrative of Augustus. And I find this just, just, again, here we are. You could call it, hey, you're making connections. Mine is true, but the rest aren't. But I found this ironic within the trope of what we're seeing. Moses has something like this. And now that we are on the subject, it would not be irrelevant to add an account of the events before his birth on the very day he was born and subsequently from which he could be drawn the hope and expectation of his greatness and enduring gr good fortune. When in ancient times, part of the wall of Villatre had been touched by lightning. This was seen as a sign that a citizen of the town would one day be ruler. Bolstered by this, the people of Velitre immediately waged war with the Roman people and on many subsequent occasions too, almost to their own de destruction. Finally, however, it became clear that this event had been assigned portending the power of Augustus. Julius Maranthus records that a few months before Augustus was born, a prodigy was generally observed at Rome, which announced that nature was bringing forth a king for the Roman people. The Senate, he continues, was most alarmed and agreed that no child born in that year should be raised. Like, they're not wanting kids to be born, same as we see with Herod the Great or Moses, where they're not wanting these kids to be reared. They're, it's the Senate, though, rather than the Sanhedrin or Herod the Great or whatever it might be. Anyway, it goes on to talk about his mother and the divine birth by the God. Of course, there's a serpent in the bed, and you could take that as this is a God having sexual union to birth Augustus. Or you could take it as uh, M. David Litwit does with Plutarch and showing that these philosophers no longer thought the gods had sex because of Plato, but that the pneuma, they, they, it was wind, just like with uh, Apollonius of Tyana, the, the gust of the wind of the geese got Apollonius's mother pregnant with him. So it was a divine conception, not through sexual union, but some other union. Either way, mm -hmm. I, I'm not here to die on the hill. The point is, is they're a son of God all of a sudden. Now, I imagine you and me would read this and go, I don't buy that. Like, I don't think that literally happened. I think it's an interesting narrative. I think it's a clever writing because as you dive into it, you'll find out more and more about the dreams and how this and that frogs aren't croaking in this area anymore. And all of this interesting legendary trope. Um, but we get to Jesus and all of a sudden this isn't. Why, why aren't we seeing that as somehow legend or at least a mixture like Trying to say, okay, maybe some of this stuff didn't happen, but I'm going to want to say something did. Okay. Again, a couple of things here, a couple of points I want to make about this. Again, uh, the, the assumption is, again, is that there's a human style argument happening here. Is that when we read things that seem miraculous to us, it's just we should assume that they are just legendary things. But this, again, is just presupposing naturalism is true, not starting from an agnostic position. This is sort of what Hume did. Anytime I come across a miracle claim, I'm just going to basically argue that it's more likely that the person lied or it's a legend because we know that these things just don't happen. Okay, well, this is just circular reasoning here. The other thing is that, okay, even if I were to grant some things are legendary that are mm -hmm. sort of added in, that's not really going to, again, change anything with regard to the truth of Christianity. Again, the truth of Christianity, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, hinges on the resurrection. And I think there's sufficient evidence to argue for that and then to take the claims of Jesus as well because he rose from the dead. It gives me more reason to trust some other things. And again, this also comes back to the, the uh, style of writing, which I covered in my video, that we see ancient authors quite often doing this thing. They're writing in sort of already existing structures and patterns. And this is just you, what the consensus of historians say. We know Rihanna and Ash, for example, the historian will say that Tacitus did this. Uh, we know Virgil wrote constantly in the Roman mythic patterns of the past as well. Uh, so, you know, if they were just somehow borrowing legendary things, again, this wouldn't prove that the events didn't happen. Because given how many stories that have existed throughout history, given how many fictional stories that have been existed, right. you're going to find overlap in some way or one another. In fact, people try to make overlaps. We see this in the modern era when we constantly keep trying to compare stories that we witness happen in real life to Romeo and Juliet stories. It doesn't mean these stories didn't happen just because we can write about them in a way that the already existing structure. So this is what I mean about it not really putting a dent in Christianity. Just the comparisons alone, just the comparisons alone does not prove anything. 
additional mm-hmm. arguments. You can take a humane style argument. You can argue directly, like internally from the Gospels, that they're more uh, like you know they're more meant to be myths. Uh, they're you know that they may have contradictions or they have errors. That kind of stuff you can have for a naturalistic explanation to counter the resurrection argument. But the comparisons alone, once again, prove nothing. Because historians have noted for years that the New Testament authors are quite often borrowing the structures and the stories from the Old Testament to write mm-hmm. about Jesus. They want to make Jesus into a new Moses or another right, King David. Right. They want you, to do that stuff. That's so why like, that's, that, that brings up an interesting thing. So first things first, you, you keep bringing up the human thing, but I'm saying, mm-hmm. why couldn't this have been a real birth? I mean, if is there a way for you to falsify that this did not actually happen to Caesar Augustus? I mean, the guy probably had divine portents. I, I'm, I'm like saying, why aren't we actually accepting what is being said about Caesar Augustus or Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great or any of these figures? And I'm looking at a book by a historian we know existed who's saying these things happened to Caesar Augustus. I don't know why we're not accepting that. I mean, scratch the Humean thing. I don't know why this isn't true. And, Do you and, think there's sufficient like evidence did. to accept their claims there when it comes to Caesar Augustus? I mean, I don't know what I don't have any evidence within Christianity, in my view, to say that this isn't legendary and, and within the same trope that I'm finding in other mythological or legendary figures. That's why I'm saying I, I don't maybe it's maybe it's New Testament material that we have to focus on because I'm mm-hmm. simply trying to show you that. I don't get how this doesn't put a dent in how we would probably view Jesus in the stories about him. You know what I mean? Because again, you mean, so again, I would agree with you. We don't have sufficient evidence to believe the stories of Caesar Augustus. So that means I also don't have sufficient evidence to be a Christian. I don't, that doesn't, that just doesn't, that's a non sequitur. That doesn't logically yeah, follow I'm, just because I'm not going to, you know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making, I'm saying this should put a dent on how we're viewing Jesus. I have, we have Christian scholars, right? Dale Allison, as you know, does not think the narratives in Matthew and Luke are history. He -hmm. thinks that they are legendary. Okay. He's a Christian. He is willing and admitting that these are legendary tropes. This is not literal history here. He is a Christian. I'm not taking that away. We're not even talking resurrection yet. We're talking simply the birth narrative. And I'm saying, well, I see a birth narrative about him, and it's legendary. I would grant. I don't see why we wouldn't do that with Jesus. That's why I'm saying so, in his birth narrative. So, okay, does Dale Allison believe in the resurrection, though? Yes, but that's, that's once again, we're shifting to the resurrection, because I'm not asking but, you whether you believe thing, that's true. I have a uh, question, though. Why does he believe in the resurrection, though? In 1970, he, do- he had an experience that actually okay, but- solidified that. Okay, good. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so he's right. got evidence, independent evidence for himself mm-hmm. to believe in the resurrection, but not the birth narratives. That's what I'm saying for Christianity. It, Dale Allison can do that as well. He can reject the birth narratives, but he's not going to go well because this is a mythological thing. That means I'm also going to reject the. Re- I'm also going to then jump and say the resurrection is also a mythological theme. That the right. jump doesn't work. He's got different independent evidence he uses. And I don't think he, I don't, I don't think he would let that go in spite of, you know, for the, for his experience. I don't know if he would, but he even admits over and over, right? We can't prove even the claims of the resurrection. He's not going out there acting like this can be historically proven in any way. It would take a faith claim or something like that. Okay. So, um, we're obviously disagreeing and people seeing this. Um, but this is this is why I wanted us to have the discussion. I think it's much needed because I do have a different worldview, Michael. And, and you know that. I mean, I'm open. I'm not hiding that I'm a naturalist. I obviously don't believe it. Um, I love the stories, though. So if you hate me so far, I hope you can at least say Derek likes the stories. Okay? I love the stories. I love <laughs> learning about this stuff. Um, couple quotes getting to the risen God thing. Um, John Granger Cook, right? So we can get Medinger, mm-hmm. but there's John Granger Cook. The review in this chapter thoroughly justifies the continued use of the category of dying, rising gods. Mind you, I'm not using this to sit here and prove Jesus is a complete myth, okay? I, I Just pointing out that God's dying and rising things. This is a scholar. The resurrection of Osiris is the closest analogy to the resurrection of Jesus. Although Osiris remains in the netherworld, wherever it is located, Horus's resurrection is a clear analogy. The rebirth or resurrection of Dionysus also provides a fairly close analogy to the resurrection of Jesus. Just as the Greek of the New Testament and New T- uh, LXX, sorry, and New Testament has its place in the matrix of classical Greek, 
So the resurrection of Christ can be placed in the matrix of the bodily resurrections of cult figures from the Mediterranean world. And that's in uh, John Granger Cook, Empty Tomb Resurrection Apotheosis. A mm -hmm. um, couple more. You care if I read them? Go for it, yeah. Okay. The sources that do indicate a clear belief in resurrection among Greeks are legion. Such a con uh, concatenation sorry, of sources simply reduces the consensus against resurrection beliefs in the ancient world to a place of other, utter weakness. One of the clearest examples of the concept of bodily resurrection comes from ancient Egypt, and they concern the god Osiris. This is relevant because the Osiris myth persisted into Egypt's coming under Greek rule and importantly is translated into the Greek mythology of the cult of Dionysus. The old Egyptian funerary text about Osiris makes clear the bodily conception of the god's resurrection. Nathan Nadal, Nato, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, Greek resurrection beliefs and the resurrection of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Context for consideration, McMaster Journal of Theology and Ministry, 22, that was a 2020 publication. And then last of all, have you read M. David Litwa? A little bit of him, yeah. He's a... I must read. In fact, he takes his he takes Bart Ehrman to task on many things where Bart doesn't think there were other Numa births, divine births through the Numa. Anyway, I did an episode on that. But over and over again, he says, right, talk about NT right, which this is scholar for scholar, right? So mm -hmm. I'm simply quoting these guys, and you can quote your, you know, plethora of academics who disagree with the other side, I'm sure. But Wright avoids speaking about the corporeal implications of post-mortem transformation in Mediterranean culture, repeatedly stressing that Greeks and Romans envisioned a transformation of the soul, not the body. To make this move plausible, Wright effectively canonizes Plato, calling his writings the New Testament for the Hellenized world. As Dag Osteen Inso points out, however, making Plato's doctrine of the immortal soul's staple fair for ancient Mediterranean did I get that? Yeah. Fair for ancient Mediterranean peoples, in particular non-philosophers, is a distortion of the general climate of, th of thought, especially in the first century CE. One has the lingering sense that Wright's account of Plato's cultural ubiquity is meant to reinforce his ten tendentious view that pagans emphasized only the immortality of the soul, leaving corporeal immortalization, i.e. the resurrection of the body, to Jews and Christians. Recent scholarship, in particular the work of Enzo, has overturned this outdated notion. Wright's highly apologetic attempt to establish the uniqueness of Jesus' resurrection fails because of superficial comparison. Jesus' resurrection much more resembles the stories of deified men immortalized after their deaths. These men are, are not just immortalized in their souls, but in their bodies as well. In David Litwa Jesus Deus, the early Christian depiction of Jesus as a Mediterranean God. And that was a 2014 publication. Thank you for tolerating my uh, quotes. So let's go through some of this here. So again, even if this is true, I, again, I don't see this as an issue for Christianity, as I explained thoroughly in my video. Uh, with some of these these comparisons, so you mentioned John uh, Granger Cook. He says right. it's an analogy for this mm -hmm. thing. Is he arguing that the Christians were copying or they were getting this idea from Osiris and I, these no. other things? Or, nope, and he doesn't okay. need to. Yeah. I mean, if you want to say it's an analogy, I mean, sure, it's possible it's an analogy, but this is just not qualitatively the same mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what's going on. Because Osiris... Can it lend weight to on does this not lend weight? That's all I'm trying to emphasize because you said it doesn't put a dent in this whole thing. Does it not lend weight to the trope is my point. Like, I don't know. Maybe we're seeing this differently, but doesn't it so, lend weight that other gods well before Jesus were doing these things and then yet Jesus comes in the same vein of doing things like these other gods? Can you, can you at least see why that makes me go, wow, okay, maybe this is just in the same vein? I would push back because I don't think Jesus, I mean, I agree with Trigvay Medinger that Jesus' resurrection is nothing like these other deities. And so I wrote to an Egyptologist about a month ago, Mark J. Smith, mm -hmm. who wrote a book on Osiris. And I asked him, right. do you see any connection here? He says, thank you for your email. I don't think there are any similarities or connection between the resurrections of Osiris and Jesus. And I don't know of any Egyptologists who do. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's very easy to go through these and go, aha, resurrection. But when you talk to them, they're like, these are qualitatively different in terms of what they meant. I mean, let's start right. like this. It's like saying, if I were to say Quintus Fabius was a dictator. Well, he was because he actually had the Roman title of dictator, but it's not qualitatively the same as saying Hitler was a dictator. 
because he was a Quintus Fabius was appointed by the Senate. There's overlap in terms of powers and titles, but they're not qualitatively the same. Likewise, when we look at some of these other uh, dying and rising gods, as Trigme Menninger goes through in his book, he knows these are just qualitatively not the same. You can find comparisons, you can find some overlap in some details. I wrote to another Egyptologist, Betsy and Brian. She said, yeah, there's no comparison between Osiris and Jesus. The only comparison she can see is that they're both judges of people that pass on from this life. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, you can find overlap in that way. But when you're talking about specifically the Jesus So story, they don't equate him resurrecting in some sense, even if it isn't to a different realm. They don't see that any way, shape, or form having some comparison? No, because Jesus doesn't resurrect into another realm. He resurrects in the same body that he died into on this earth. It's not mm-hmm. the same qualitatively thing. It, it's it's different. And so, yeah, there is – you can say you can find an analogy yeah. to Osiris dying and rise. Fine. It's an analogy. Sure. I can come up with analogies today for things mm-hmm. in the Bible quite easily. I mean, but who cares? That doesn't mean that this is part of a dying and rising God category that was thrown. Right. The and we world. don't need a category, even if that is – if there is a category, we don't need to die on a hill of whether or not there's a category or not. I think that the idea is it could be ubiquitous. I mean, it's just simply people die and then they're hoping that they come to live forever. Immortalization seems to be a common mm-hmm. theme without wherever the civilization is. Um, well, I mean, I mean, yeah, people in the ancient world wanted to not die. I, right. I don't see that as like, a, and so they're going to come up with, I mean, we come up with stories today of people not dying in movies and Hollywood today. I mean, so what? I don't see that as proving so- whether or not Christianity is true or not. So let's get into the New Testament, since none of these other gods, uh, at least in your estimation, are true. You you don't worship Osiris. You don't worship any other gods. You don't believe them. Um, what What is the evidence to you that is just so clear that this is true about Jesus? He actually did these things. What is it that makes you so convinced of this? Well, I'm going to start doing a series probably this summer, and I'll be trying to argue for more of the reliability of the uh, the Gospels. And so my argument is simply that I think the Gospels are reliable to what was originally written and what was come, came from eyewitnesses, as Luke tells us in the opening of his book. Uh, and I think that supports that this is coming from the earliest Christians that would have witnessed Jesus. Then what convinces me that Christianity is true is, again, the resurrection argument. It's mm-hmm. I think that we have sufficient evidence to suggest the most likely explanation. I can't prove it, I'll admit, but I would say it has the most explanatory scope, explanatory power, it is the least ad hoc and the most plausible. So I take that historical criteria. I don't use Bayes' theorem. I use this, this which is going to be the least ad hoc and most plausible. Now, I also, and I want to be clear about this, I also do not argue for the truth of Christianity just from that. I'm a classicalist, and so a classical apologist. So what I would say is, first I need to argue that a God exists, and I use other arguments for that, like emergent universe argument, or cosmic conscious argument or the moral argument. If I can establish that there is already a God that is existing in the background knowledge, it then, I think, lends support to the resurrection hypothesis being more plausible. So that's how I take the approach. I start with arguing that a God exists. Then I argue that the New Testament is most likely to be reliable. And then I argue that the data that we get from the New Testament would support the most likely explanation of how Christianity got started would be the resurrection. Okay. Um, I just wanted you to spell that out. So I, you, you have your case. I would say I'm taking a different path. I'm trying to look at this and say, is this legendary? Is this, uh, did this really happen or are they writing this in such a manner and within the same vein of Mediterranean narratives and, uh, potentially you even see people who are joining in that death with the God through a particular ritual and such that I find like with Osiris or any other type of mystery religion you might find there at the time, not saying Christianity is one, but that there seems to be something to this. M. David Litwa talks about, and I'm, I'm, I'm more of the, like, I don't believe any of them really are true. Um, but I'm sitting here learning, trying to learn more. So let's get to super chats because I, and you can go back and forth. I was going to mention, I loved your part about Hector in your video. I do think that there is actual reasons. I go with like Dennis here and thinking there is some trope with Hector, Jesus. And I I want to say about that. That wasn't mine. I got that from Michael Kona. He gave me all that. So I want to be clear that that was all him. He did the research and got me that. I love that. No, I do. And now, of course, I know you were using it to point out like, hey, I mean, 
Is there a reason they're writing this and it does look this way? Could it have genetic connection? Dennis McDonald, of course, in his book um, says yes. And he, of course, goes over the top, if you will, for this case to show Mark is aware of Homer's Iliad, the Odyssey. Um, Axe is aware of the Aeneid in competition with the Judeo Julio Claudio line. So the Roman imperial cult is definitely in competition with the Jesus movement. And so I I'm, I'm, I just hope people watching will stay tuned to what you do and what I do and consider what the scholars are saying and make their own minds up as we continue. I'm no expert. I will say, I will say if I'm going to plug one book, if people want to know yeah. why I think the argument against miracles is so bad, there's a book written by an atheist, Hume's Abject Failure by John Ehrman. It's Clary. Uh, it basically, it's really Clary. Oh, let me try again. So it's Hume's Abject Failure by John Ehrman. Okay. He is an atheist, and he said that you know you can't argue against miracles in this sort of way, uh, sort of like just – so he actually makes a pretty good – talks about eyewitness testimony and some other good things. He uses Bayes in there as well. So if anyone's interested, that would be my the book I would plug. Right. Okay. Back to Super Chats. Thank you for supporting the channel. Ask away. You can tell a story uh, – you can tell a true story with tropes. Well, yeah, I think that's – that's possible. I would yeah. then ask, though, if you're using this trope for me, my my whole particular would be how much of this is history and how much of this isn't. If you're if you're forcing this narrative to fit a trope, I feel like something's going to fudge in order to match that trope. Now, you might be the person who goes, no, I think literally to the T, Jesus literally looked like Moses in every single way. And there's <laughs> no fudging of the data. I personally, I think that's just not, I don't think that's fair. I think that that's not treating this literature like you would any other literature of the time. I just think that's special pleading on how this material is being used versus everything else. So you could have a true story. You could have history there and use tropes. That's my thought. So Alonzo, thank you so much for that. I, um, I will say this, that um, I did a video about a year or so ago, I think. Um, it was on, was Jesus stolen from the Old Testament? And I talk about how uh, Robert Price points out that there's a lot of like these passages in the Old te in the New Testament that are paralleling stories in the Old Testament. Right. And so he's arguing, it's a, this, yeah, this, the video is, is the story of Jesus stolen from the Old Testament. And at the end of the video, I point out that if you kind of go through these comparisons that Price pulls up, uh, there's no order in the Old Testament. It just seems like they're randomly plicking, pucking this one out, and then they're picking mm -hmm. this one out, and then picking that one out. And so there's just no it, – it's just like they're really cherry-picking a lot of the Old Testament. And it, it seems more likely that they're witnessing the story of Jesus unfold in their lives, and they're going, oh, you know what this reminds me of? This in the Old Testament. Oh, nope, that reminds me of this in the Old Testament. If there was more of a structure to what they took from the Old Testament, I think that would – make a better argument but because it's so scatterbrained from what they're pulling from the old testament it seems more likely they're doing the other thing which is that let's just see what what, what we're witnessing now we can compare it to what has already happened in the past mm -hmm. which was a common thing the ancient authors did yeah so i i'm going in that vein i have thought and wrestled this with caleb jackson me and caleb we talk a lot and it's for me it's between did they pick old testament passages to slap on to things that were happening in the or at least they were saying, here's the story of Jesus. We're going to have these Old Testament passages, uh, put them into this narrative and formulate this in a way overlap, overlapping the history. Or are they inventing somewhat of this narrative using Old Testament passages? And I wrestle between the both of those mm -hmm. two positions. Um, I think there is some order in certain places in Matthew, as uh, Allison was saying, but not everything. So like you said, they are mm -hmm. cherry picking. I just wouldn't say everything is the sequential order of stuff, but there is some order in certain places. I think the temptation, for example, um, and there are other examples. I can't remember that Allison brought up in his commentary on Matthew, but there, there's a lot there. Uh, Cedric, I can't pronounce your last name without butchering it. I just want to say I might be a little strange, but I'm a huge fan of both of your uh, IP and myth vision channels. Well, thank you. Thank you for that support. I really appreciate the compliment. His, he needs to fix his hat. It's going to bother me. Oh, <laughs> now he's going to take the money back. This isn't going to work. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes, <laughs> I get, sometimes I get like um, OCD about that. I'm like, put your hat on right. <laughs> I'm appreciate old. that. Humanist Reformation, it all comes down to special pleading. That's what all religions need to do. And it's not because they are true. Okay. I, I mean, special pleading is if, if you treat two things that are the same, 
uh, but you treat one differently. But if so, real special pleading is is like if you have actual reasons to believe or accept something else, it's no longer special pleading because the reasons change. You now have provided additional reasons to treat one differently. And so the argument would be, well, sure, if they're all the same, it is special pleading, but no religious person makes that argument that all the religions are the same. So, you know, that special is that pleading, the, the argument of special pleading doesn't work. What was that? Special, Sorry, I didn't hear. Special pleading, is that the definition? I don't even know if that's, because the way I understood it is, well, it mine be is true pleading. I mean, argument it's, it's, with, it's, in which the speaker deliberately ignores aspects that are unfavorable to their point of view, so that could be even within the New Testament, appeals well, to give a particular interest group special treatment. Yeah. So it's special pleading if and only if we don't have good reasons to make an exception. And so like that would be the argument is that we would argue that we have evidence that shows that this is an exception. Uh, just like with the moon landing, we have plenty of evidence to believe that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon, even though we have all these other stories of people going to the moon in fiction. We have reasons to make an exception for this one story from 1969. The same would apply anyway. So it's not special pleading. Yeah. And so in my mind, I would say, so I, I take this other position, right? The scholars that I'm engaging with and talking with are, are pointing out that these aren't true, or at least there's good reasons not to buy that this actually happened and stuff. I guess it depends on the scholars you're reading. And so when I'm hearing people say there is a good case, like N.T. Wright, Mike Lacona, whoever it might be saying it is true. And the other scholars are going, hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm not buying it. There's problems. It, it almost becomes a subjective way of applying that definition because it's like, oh, it seems like special pleading from our perception, the way that Christians are treating this versus the way you guys would maybe say, hey, no, I'm convinced of the data. This convinces me and that other stuff doesn't. Whereas for us, we're like, we're not convinced by it either way. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that humanist. Deep Drinks podcast. Love seeing daddy philosophy versus mm -hmm. daddy myth vision. That felt funny Ooh, saying it. It's creepy. It's creepy, dude. <sighs> Resurrection destroyed. Amen. Great combo, guys. <laughs> I think people wanted to see us like smash each other he, here. Just if he keeps if if he keeps calling me daddy because he's done it before, tell him he does it again. I'm gonna punish him. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Camille Gregor in the house. If Jesus was the only person in history who was believed to be resurrection and ascended to heaven. Would that move the probability of Christianity up or down in any way? No, I don't think that would. I, I, if the none, if we like, let's say like we had a historical, you know, all these texts about like Osiris or Romulus just didn't exist. I'm not going to be like, oh, look, there's only one story, therefore it's more likely to be true. That's just not how evidence works. So no, I'm going to be consistent here. I'm not just going to say yes. If there was only one story, it would make my my worldview more true. No. I don't think that works. Okay. Camille, thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate the support. Kyle Alander says, Derek, wouldn't Jesus resurrection be a case of probabilistic independence? Other myths seem to have no effect on the resurrection evidence. I don't think that's a fair assessment. I know you disagree with me, Michael. I can't imagine entering the ancient world in a Mediterranean world where other heroes, demigods, gods, born by gods, having portents of their birth, prophecies of their coming and whatever, and their death and then apotheosis, which I do think the earliest Christian um, material has this. He goes from the grave to ascension, right? I think that the narratives where we disagree you and me are going to disagree. I don't think there's this long sojourn on earth. I think this, you could say he was bodily resurrected, but I would even go so far as to say bodily transfigured or transformed. So in a sense, this same body becomes something altogether new, not flesh and blood. This is my opinion. Um, so like I'm looking at this and I can't approach the ancient world, Kyle, and go, well, I'm only going to just look at this one piece of evidence and ignore the furniture of the Mediterranean stories and I use the word stories because I see tropes and I can't not see this as a trope. So for me, it does, it plays a role to, to reverse what Michael says. It does put a dent in how I'm observing this specific claim within the zeitgeist of all the others that are out there. It absolutely does for me at least. So, well, let me ask you this. Like, let's say like, 
we went to an alien planet and we wanted to convince them we were gods. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Are we going to like, let's say, like, we're, let's say we're going to like, we got to do things that are, they're going to think would show that we're gods. And let's say they believe that, you know, to be divine, you have to like die and rise. Okay. Well then we're going to do that because we want to convince them. I think mm -hmm. God, if he, you know, if this trope really does exist, why does he have to completely avoid that? If he wanted to reveal himself to humanity, like he's going to show divinity right. in ways that people are going to understand divinity. I don't see. So if we, if we, if we were to look at it from a perspective of God, why does he have to scour the pagan myths to make sure that anything he does has not actually already been talked about in some sort of myth somewhere? I just don't think that logically follows. No, and it doesn't. It doesn't. I'm starting at it differently, right? So I'm not assuming this God needs to enter the world in order to mimic a ubiquitous experience that we humans have that we die and therefore we need to come back and live forever. I think it's more – I think – Here's all sorts of different methodology that you and me would approach us differently, I suspect. I think it's from humans that we would concoct these narratives and through our experience that we would create these things, which brings us to a whole different toolkit on how we're approaching this material. I'm not thinking, here's a story, human history is a story, God needs to come in, and the only way to really project that he's really doing it is to mimic what humans have been expecting or seeing or hoping through the other stories, whether they be pagan or Jewish or whatever. So he's, if he's going to do something, it's going to be what we're already seeing people are kind of doing in their stories. Mm -hmm. But this one's true and those aren't. And that's where I'm like, mm, I think uh, starting with us, right. And working outward rather than thinking, here's this cosmic God and working uh, down. So, Maybe we're starting in different points, and that's why our perception is different. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Someone else smarter than us maybe can look at us and go, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying, and I see what you're saying. And Okay, scrolling down, Humanist Reformation is back again. Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, warn us of people like Jesus. Do you make excuses and favorable reinterpretation just for Christianity, or do you do, you do it for other religions too? So is this the one about false prophecies? Yeah, I think so. Okay, well, let, let's just wait till March. But you're going to be – okay, so give us some insight as to what you're doing in March so that people know. So in March, I'm going to start a four-part series on eschatology. The first one is is going to be, was Jesus a failed apocalyptic prophet? Mm -hmm. The second one will be, why Jesus hasn't returned yet? The third one will be a, a case for post-millennialism, which is my eschatological view. So it might just I might call that one end times, a new perspective. And then the fourth one will be on the rapture. And why that's just are you crap. a partial protest? Yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah, I kind so, of figured the, the first revelation. One will, the, the, the first one is going to address Deuteronomy 18 directly. And I'm going to go into Old Testament prophecy and a lot of different stuff. I have a lot of I think the video is over 30 minutes. So it's going to be there's a lot to cover. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I might respond. You know, you know me. Mm -hmm. You know my position. Here we are <laughs> with different positions, right? Uh, humanist mm -hmm. and me probably shared the same position in many ways on this particular topic. I really appreciate the support. Thank you so much. Sure. I'll even tell Camille. you this, Derek. I might even I might even agree with you that uh, Jesus did predict the end of the first century. So you might Ooh. I might. So I got something else to talk about. This would be a good follow up conversation because this is my wheelhouse. I really enjoy getting into this uh, apocalyptic eschatological material. It, it, it was the last stand I had becoming a full preterist full-on heresy. Mm -hmm. um, but I was trying. I was. I mean, dude, mm -hmm. I tried. I really did, Michael. And that's what I hope that you're seeing with this conversation is that I am trying. Mm -hmm. You can disagree yeah. with me till cows fly, which means you're always going to disagree with me. Uh, but that would be my Humean uh, worldview, saying cows can't fly. So uh, anyway, Camille Greger, thank you for the super chat. Do you think some non-Christian beliefs about heavenly ascensions are based on earlier non-Christian beliefs? about heavenly ascension, how would you tell if those cases are not or are or are not a Titan Titanic situation? It would be the evidence specific to each of the cases. Like, do we have enough to suggest this one? The earlier ones were written in a mythological fashion and we don't have evidence to really support them. You know, it's the same thing with how I would judge the Titan Titanic. I, we can find the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean. We have numerous reports that it sank and how it sank. We know the Titan was a work of fiction. Uh, no one argued that it was actually an historical event. Uh, so again, it's about judging these things on a case-by-case -case basis and the evidence for them. Okay. Camille, um, thank you for the support. I'd love, if you have examples down the road, I'd love to get into those and, you know, dive in. Because for me, Michael, just addressing this, 
Um, I, Camille's asking a specific question, but just addressing this for me, I can't imagine like the whole Greek world or the whole Roman world. I can't imagine these people believed their stories were myths. I can't like if I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, I'm going to go, they're all believing in nonsense and they just have no evidence in their view. They have no book or writings or anything like that, that somehow convinces them that this is true. I, I think well, they probably well, did. I, I can agree with you on that. I mean, I, I can believe today that Muslims think that Muhammad really did, you know, split the moon. Mm -hmm. I, I think they really do believe that. I'm just not convinced of their evidence. So, I mean, it's a case by case basis. Right. I guess using Asclepius instead of moon splitting, he resurrects people or heals people, these kind of things. I see Jesus doing similar stuff and I'm going, you know, these people really believed Asclepius was true. Contra Kelsum, right? Uh, Kelsey, Kelsus talks about people actually had Asclepius appear to them and say like he has actually shown up to them and whatnot. Uh, I guess my point is people believed this stuff. Lots and lots of people believed it. Just like you and me don't believe that Islam is true. I just we get to Christianity and then we split and we don't I mean, see our eye. Even if you could prove that, that even if there was a good case for some of that, I mean that's not going to confirm naturalism. It's just going to confirm a, a you know a beyond natural worldview. And again, there's a lot of Christians throughout time that did believe some of these reports. They just attributed them to demons. So I mean, right, like right. this wouldn't this wouldn't really even support the naturalistic case. It would just mean we clearly have far more evidence that there's something beyond the natural at the end of the right. day. Right. I would be doing a different argument to make it more of a. I think these are human. And, and going from there. So that is a different point. I just figure I'd get that idea brought up. Camille, I hope I didn't take off of your question or away from that at all. I really appreciate the support people. I really do. Scrolling down. Um, we've got a little gap here between the supers. Just heading down. Okay. Camille's back again. Um, there's a cup on my desk. How likely is it God will cause it levitate in the next 10 minutes to bring about a great good? If I'm agnostic about miracles, should I treat yes and no as equally likely? So I'm kind of not sure what you're asking. Are you asking that should God make the cup levitate to prove that he exists and then there you wouldn't be agnostic anymore? If, if that's the case, I just I don't think that's what God is trying to do in people. It's he's not trying to cause basic theism and cognitively robust theism, as Paul Moser points out. And you know, to quote from C.S. Lewis, he's not a butler or a grandfather in the sky. Uh, he's not just there to uh, serve our every whims and desires. There's something more complicated he's trying to do in humans. And so this is not just about, you know, him trying to prove mere basic existence. Thank you, Camille. Camille's back again. Does IP have evidence of Jesus's resurrection independent from the historical evidence? And yes, would he still be a Christian without that independent evidence? So independent from the historical evidence, I would assume it's something like um, some sort of like appearance I've had. I've not witnessed any like miracles. I've never seen Jesus or had a dream or anything like that. Uh, so no, I use the historical evidence. What about subjective experience? No, I've never, I've never, I've never, Jesus never appeared to me. Not, so, I mean, like, I'm just going on what the evidence is available to me. And even if I did, I mean, like, like, let's well, say I don't, mean, I don't mean an appearance necessarily, but please continue. So go ahead. Oh, like, wait, 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 let's say you and I were in the forest and we saw a leprechaun come out and moon us and run away. No one would believe us because it's just so weird, but we would believe right. it true. You know, if I actually did have an a subjective experience of Jesus, which I haven't, you know, that would be for me. I couldn't use that to make my case. And, I, you know, mm -hmm. I could... I should also weigh that subjective case against the historical evidence. Did I, was it an hallucination or these kinds of things? You know, I'm not just going to, you know, you got to weigh these different things and you got to look at different ways that they can be explained. You just can't, it, it's got to be, you can't put a, one explanation as the only possible one. You got to try to be as unbiased as you possibly can be. See, I had experiences. That's what I'm getting at. Not necessarily uh, Jesus actually appeared to me, but I had dreams um, I have had literally like groundbreaking, warm, sensational, comforting feelings of, of like, I'm not alone. I have a heavenly father who's going to take care of me. Like I had these experiences, which helped me drive my faith, um, in, in Jesus that I knew I was there. I had a comforter, all of that kind of stuff. And I guess, I don't know. I don't know if that's counting yeah. as independent evidence in what Camille's trying to suggest here. I mean, I would just say the Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is uh, deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's like, 
Mormons tell me the same thing. They have experiences and they know they're right. I'm like, okay, well, I, I can't judge that. I, I got to go on what the evidence that actually is available. I mean, you may have, may or may not have had those experiences. I mean, everyone tells me they have experiences. And I'm yeah. just like, okay, well, if the same thing happened to me, I would not use that as just like my defining moment. Of oh, no, no. Belief. But the dr a driving reason for why someone would stay in the faith, like um, like Allison had, a, you know, I think he had a visionary experience or something. But like, let's let's suppose after investigation, because he's pretty critical. Um, he admits to me, you know, and I think he's open on air, but he's told me plenty of times it isn't the evidence, like reading the New Testament, that just convinces me. There, there's no like I read this material and oh my God, I'm convinced that Christianity is true. No, he had an experience. He did not go. I approached this, and the material is so overwhelmingly convincing that people should just read it and know and go, "Wow, he had that 1970 something experience." And so, I think that's what I'm trying to get at. But anyway, Camille, love you. Thank you for the support, my friend. Continuing, I'm trying to blast down here. And Michael, if you want to like put me on trial, I'm more than happy to get picked apart on your channel if you ever wanted to. Not sure if I'm worthy though to even appear on your channel. But uh, anywho, Camille's back again. IP, put on your atheist cap. There. <laughs> Can you, as an atheist, explain why there are differences between resurrections and ascensions of Jesus and other ancient Mediterranean figures? Can I explain why there are differences between the resurrection and ascension of Jesus and other mythical figures? Okay, oh, the accounts are different. I mean, Jesus physically rises, the body that's in the tomb comes back to life in a new glorified uh, version of its own self, and then he's on the earth for 40 days or so, and then he ascends into heaven. I mean, I'd have to gen look at each individual case. I mean, we were talking about Osiris earlier. He does His body stays on earth, and he gets a new body in the, in the underworld. Uh, now, what if, what if, what if I could show you and give me some time to pull the sources here? Cause I've got some scholars. What if I could show you some contemporaneous rather than, you know, necessarily pulling from Osiris cause we get pulled from Osiris, but let's say some, some Greco Roman, um, figures and they had bodily rows. What if I could show you some of that stuff in the material? You know what I mean? Okay. What, I mean, that like help? It would just mean we have other stories. Like I'm again, I'm not going to judge the moon landing because at the same time there were many fictions written at the same time about people going to the moon. I mean, mm -hmm. I would say we still evidence for each case on the same basis. Okay, we don't. Mike Lacona or Gary Habermas or even the like the um, um, the McGrews, for example, do not argue uh, like. Well, you know, that we have this resurrection of Jesus. No one else ever had anything like it. Therefore, it's more likely to be true. No, they go, let's look at what the, you know, Paul told us. Let's look at what uh, the evidence for the empty tomb shows us. Let's look and see if the gospels are reliable and what they're reporting. That's how you do it. And then if you bring these other stories, I'm going to do the same thing. All right, let's see what, what, let's see who's reporting it. Let's see, uh, do we have skeptics to convert? Do we have any reason to think there was an empty tomb? Do we have any reason to think they used embarrassing features or, you know, the same kind of things? I'm going to judge it the same way I would argue for the resurrection. I, I judge the text based on that. I don't see that I'm not going to do this, this non sequitur where I go, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. And if you found, found me a kind of Hercules rising from the dead, aha, then he must have also risen from the dead because I have plenty of evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. It's like my, the analogy I gave earlier with Horace. If Horace appeared to us and said, I rose from the dead, I'd be like, okay, that's not going to be evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, though. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay, uh, just making sure we did answer this question because Camille's been hooking me up today. Can you, as an atheist, explain why there are differences between resurrections and ascensions of Jesus and other Mediterranean figures? So, I mean, there's differences because they're 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 coming from different sources or coming from different um uh, accounts of what happened. I mean, of course, there's going to be differences. The, the Jesus story comes from the Jewish background, very much heaped in that. That's, they quote the Old Testament over 300 times. I mean, other ones are going to come more from the Roman pagan background or the Greek background or the Egyptian background. So if that's what he's asking, that's what I would say. Thank you, Camille. Appreciate you, Michael. All right, scrolling down. Addison, how dissimilar do pagan parallels have to be before Derek realizes that they prove nothing? Addison saying, pretty much stop the parallels. Stop considering this is the furniture 
of the Greco-Roman trope of gods, demigods dying and rising like Caesar Augustus, Julius Caesar. Um, they don't prove this one isn't true. What it does for me is it says, man, we've got this vast amount of evidence of people who believe that this is true of Caesar Augustus, Julius Caesar, which are real historical figures or mythological ones like Romulus, Hercules, Asclepius, Osiris, you name it. And I'm going, why is this one true? I don't read the New Testament with the same kind of faith or the same kind of convincing evidence the way that you do. And so um, once I look at that and I picked it apart and I look and say, okay, I do think these are contradictions. You might say, no, I don't find these as contradictions. I do find that the narratives are trying to paint Jesus differently. Uh, for example, with his death or his burial or the empty tomb narratives or birth narratives or whatever, I see all these things. And I go, after seeing the trope and then seeing dissimilarity within the new Testament stuff and this material, I can't help but walk away and say, Hmm, it walks like a duck and talks like a duck. I think it's a duck. And that's why the thrust of the evidence, in my view, is that this is fitting the same trope along with all the others. The case has to be overwhelming to me, overwhelming to make me go, this one's true. All of the others are not true. And that's where I'm coming from. Just to voice my thoughts. So uh, you want to tag on to that or do you want me to continue? No, we got more to get through so we can move on. Okay. I don't even see what you see. So you probably are afraid of how many we have left or something. <laughs> oh, there's a uh, lot. Okay. I'm trying. So please bear with me, uh, Michael. Sorry that this has taken some time here. David Hep Hepworth, IP mentioned no <coughs> legends are qual qualitatively comparable to Christianity, but that there are admitted similarities. That seems contradictory. Well, I didn't say that, so um, I said that they're qualitatively different, even though you can find some overlaps. I mean, the more you get into the specifics, they're going to be different is what I was trying to say. But yeah, I, I find there are clearly overlaps in some ways. So what? I'm not trying to say they're entirely different when I said they're qualitatively different. I just meant that the Jesus' resurrection is, a, is clearly in its Jewish background with the physical resurrection of that body that died. Uh, Cyrus, for example, is not. It's more of an Egyptian understanding of these things. And so there's going to be differences, even though you could make an analogy between the two. So sorry if I wasn't clear earlier. Thank you, David. Sentinel Apologetics, thank you for that super chat. First, the difference is that Greco-Roman text envision ascent from earth to heaven, but none as exaltation after mm -hmm. resurrection because they did not envision the body restoration after death. That's why I quoted Litwa. Um, Litwa disagrees with this. This is why I say we need to read other scholars than just the ones on our team so we can actually hear the sources that they're saying. There is bodily resurrection within Greco-Roman uh, figures. And even Hercules, after he burns on a pyre, is off in heaven having kids. He's eating. He has physical he's, – he's, I think he's, what Rob means, though, is that you can, you can have these stories like Osiris where you do get a new body. It's that actual body that dies just stays in the grave, I think is what he's trying to argue. But, yeah, uh, you can have stories okay. of, like Hercules getting a new body. Osiris gets a new body. In his what about the world. missing body tropes within the Greco-Roman world? I mean the point is they're missing because they, they literally have gone to heaven. So we'll have to get into some of these sources because yeah. th they're well, so – there's going to be entire. You know, there's there's other like Romulus. You know that's an entirely different belief than Osiris. I mean, with regards right. to the body. So you you have those. I think what he's just trying to point out is that the Jewish one is the is the background for Jesus, and when you get out of that background, there's going to be there's going to be variation and differences. Yeah, and this is where I think it's not just Jewish. We're not only talking about a Hellenized movement and what that even means is is that's a whole can of worms. That's why I was saying M. David Litwa. Uh, highly recommend also Richard C. Miller, who's in the same vein. It is not just Jewish. It is it is Hellenized Judaism, which is a combination of the Greco-Roman world and Jewish thinking. And in, in even in Hellenistic Jewish thought, Zeus, uh, Yahweh, literally were interchangeable names within certain groups and communities in the Jewish world that were not in Palestine. So you had, you know, people with variations on how they're they're using that belief of their Hebrew Bible. Yeah, but I mean, they didn't mean the same thing. The Stoics said Zeus was the creator of all things, but the Stoics believed in this pantheistic deity they called Zeus. They just borrowed the name. So Zeus. Oh, was no, like no. There are 
it, so that may be the case in certain other contexts, but there are in the context of Hellenized Judaism, there are cases where literally they're saying, well, that's the name for Yahweh in Greek. Oh, and yeah, our name, that, yeah. This is what I'm trying to get at. So they're just trying like Cicero quotes and says something like, well, you know, the name for our God is actually in Africa. It's different than it is over here yeah. and over here. Oh, yeah. But it's really if you went to those contexts, it's really a different God. But they're kind of trying to uh, harmonize society or syncretize their their mythos. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, that happened between Baal and Zeus as well. Uh, They're both storm deities, so they were synchronized. Right, right. Thank you, Sentinel. I appreciate the love. Let me scroll down here. Indo in the house. The Garden of Eden in the North Pole. <laughs> <laughs> He's referring to a TikTok video I did where someone tried oh, to argue okay. that like... it. So you got to keep up with my TikTok. That's what you get. That's how you get the reference. That's C. I'm not. I, I gotta, I gotta keep up with it. Um, Sentinel apologetics again. Second, it is true that their ascension text involved apotheosis, but Jesus is already divine, and ascension accounts do not connotate deification or the, the conferral of immortality. Also, for everyone, that I don't believe either. I mean, there's so many things we disagree on, even in this. I think he becomes immortalized after his death with Romans one four. Right. So there, like. The even the Philippians hymn, James D. G. G. D. G. Dunn, and these are Christian scholars, and of course, other scholars like I'm talking with um, uh, what is his name? Uh, James F. McGrath and others that are like, no, this is an Adam theology that Jesus didn't, it's not a pre existent argument. Maybe Bart Ehrman thinks it's pre existent, and others, but James F. McGrath in the Philippians to him is saying, this is Adam. So while Adam thought it was right to grasp equality with God. Jesus did not. He humbled himself to death. And then because of his death, boom, apotheosis, he gets deified. And so we have, we have complete different perceptions of how we're approaching the material. And that's why we have to have the conversations, Michael. If we don't have them, then you can't know why I think the way I do. And I can't know that why the, you think the way you do. And mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Imnag, thank you for the super sticker. I really appreciate that. I'm looking down um, to make sure I didn't miss a question or a comment. I seriously appreciate the love and support. Okay, is it, there's always a debate happening in the chat that is better yeah. than our discussion. You know, it's it's. Oh gosh, I'm trying to blast through these, Michael. We're getting hit. Please, uh, I guess, Michael, I don't want to keep you too long, so we want to cut off super chats after this right here, just to try and get through them. Okay. Are you okay is my question. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're fine. I could probably go another 10, 15 minutes or so. So I please, after though, this last one. Yeah, after this last one, I ask, just reserve the Super Chats. We can always do this again in the future. I, I'm mm -hmm. just wanting to make sure that I respect Michael's time because he's generous in coming here and hanging out with me. So, David, you two have had a big impact on my life. IP made me feel safe to question what I had been told about the Bible, and Derek provides the answers. So you can tell his perception is more in my perception, but that's a good quality that you're actually getting people to feel comfortable asking questions. Mm -hmm. I think that's important that we do. I didn't feel like I could, and I got excommunicated because I actually was trying to do the eschatology apocalypticism thing and not to see that he was felled. I was trying to make sure that it all happened. I was trying to save the savior in my view, stupid whore energy. I always feel funny when I say her name, uh, <laughs> Josephus documented Jesus existence, but why did he not vouch for his miracles? Okay. Well, because he was an Orthodox Jew and he believed that, you know, he was trying to write to, um, under the the guys under the the power of the Roman Empire, and he was trying to talk up Vespasian, for example. I mean, it'd be really weird of him to just to be like, "Oh yeah, by the way, there's this other challenger out here who's rivaling Vespasian and his miracles." Uh, that would not be a safe thing to say. He also didn't believe in Jesus's miracles. He did, I believe, in the uh, uninterpolated one that scholars propose on the testimonium. He'll say that um, Josephus says that they reported that they saw him alive after his death. So he does at least report in the uninterpolated version that people did believe Jesus rose from the dead. But I mean, two reasons. He's an Orthodox Jew. Uh, he doesn't actually become a Christian. And he's also writing under the power of the Roman Empire. I don't think he wants to upset them anyway. Right. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to get 
through here we are sentinel says third the crux is that it is only in christian theology that humans are given apotheosis when conformed to christ romans 8 29 through 30 due to the hypostasis of the logos during his kenosis in the body i'm not going to waste going into a uh, rebut of this i'm not going to get into are there other examples or you know but thank you for the super chat and you were heard sentinel thank you Festering boils. Did God realize that reasonable people would doubt the gospel stories because of the similarities to previous false gods? Okay, this is assuming that a people are just always one hundred percent reasonable. None of us are. Uh, we're a mix of emotions and reason. Uh, we this idea that there was like these non. I don't buy that there was these non-resistant non-believers out there. Uh, this just doesn't seem like an understanding of proper human psychology at all. And so I'm not, I'm not going to psychoanalyze. I'm not going to assume that a, we're always reasonable or that I'm always reasonable. I'm just going to try to my best to argue for the evidence of uh, God. Who's perfectly just knows how to judge. And, will, and if there are reasonable people, as C.S. Lewis said, honest rejection of Christ, however wrong shall be forgiven and healed. So if the, that is the case, well, okay. I would agree with Lewis on that then. If that is the case, I hope that's the case. <laughs> I hope origins, right. Well, if anything, I'm also I'm also a legal universalist, so I don't think anybody is in hell unless they want to be there. The only reason people are in hell is because they don't want to go through um, judgment. They don't want to stand and answer for or give an account of everything they, they did, as Paul talks about. Interesting. Cedric, thank you for the super chat. Michael, enjoy my hat. Derek, it's like Spanish <laughs> Lorenzo. Okay, uh, thank you for clarifying. Do you guys plan on doing more of these awesome discussions? As, as, long as, Derek's, as long as Derek plans to stop hitting on me. I'm getting sick of it. Told him I'm married. Stop what? Stop hitting on me. I told you I'm married. Listen, we. I told you flirting is a part of it. I mean, in. come on. Give me a break, Don't Michael. I can't me. help it. It's the beard. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you so much, Cedric Lorenzo. I appreciate the super chat. Uh, Carlos Rodriguez, IP, can you admit it's at least reasonable for an unbeliever to continue in their unbelief based on honest evaluation of the testimonies of dead human gospel writers and living contemporary Christians? I don't know how you're defining reasonable. Uh, and again, I'm not going to try to psychoanalyze people, but I'm also not going to go in the opposite direction and say that, yeah, everyone's is perfectly reasonable in their assessment. Again, I'm just going to do my best to pull back from that and say, here's why I'm convinced of my worldview and here's the evidence. Okay. I can't speak to anyone specifically and I'm not going to, because I've tried very hard not to become a person who psychoanalyzes others. Yeah. I have, I do that sometimes. And I mean, I can't help, but imagine there's different reasons, motivating factors, right? And it's a good practice not to do. And I do catch myself do that. I'm guilty of it. Um, I'm guilty of it too. Yeah. Let me put it this way. Let's use Carlos's super chat just to put it like this. If and you obviously there's material I read that you don't or haven't, and there's material you've mm -hmm. read that I don't and haven't. So I guess if I were to able to plug a chip into your mind for a moment to see the way I see these things and understand the things that I've been looking at, then I would imagine this would be an easy answer to say, okay, in your specific case, I understand why you don't. I understand why it's not convincing to you and such. And I imagine vice versa. If for some reason you put the chip in my head and I saw your brain the way that you think, then maybe I would get it. You know what I mean? But that's why these conversations need to be happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Carlos, with that. Yeah. thank you so much, Carlos, for that super chat. I got to take uh, I IP on a date later. Um, Vesper, thank you for the super chat. What is the contemporary evidence which differentiates between Jesus' resurrection from other dying and rising narratives? So it'd be the evidence for the resurrection that we see the scholars have argued for. Uh, uh, what gets Christianity going? What causes this this Christian movement? And scholars um, like you know Brett, Brent Petrie, Mike Lacona, Gary Habermas, the, like the uh, McGrews, argue the most likely explanation is that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Uh, all of their naturalistic accounts to try to explain the uh, what how Christianity got going become ad hoc, uh, less plausible and multiply explain, uh, different assumptions in order to explain all, all the data that's available. So it, it starts also with arguing for the reliability of the New Testament, though. So that is that is where Christians argue. Uh, that is where we come from. Um, and so that's what I would say. Let me ask you this in the vein of this question. Dionysus, 
Um, he's killed by the Titans, of course, uh, chewed up, if you will. Uh, his flesh is ripped, which Dennis McDonald thinks that in John's gospel, there's something going on with eating Jesus' flesh. It's, in Greek, it means chew. But the Titans do this, and he comes back. He, he 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 resurrects in some sense. Maybe the term isn't resurrected, but he comes back no, to some way he's coming back, right? Um, why do people believe that? Why did people believe Dionysus' story? Did it take a miracle for people to I follow think, this? So I remember it was Ovid who I was reading on this, and he, he doesn't say resurrection. It's more about reincarnation, I think. I did a TikTok video on this, I think, about a month ago where I talked about this. Yeah, I did, because I replied to a video by Lawrence Krauss where he brought this up. So if I recall what I said in the video, that it's more about reincarnation in, in the sources. Uh, and from it also was like an analogy for like, uh, the making of wine, you know, that, that he's being ground up, chewed up. It's sort of like this wine issue. Uh, mm -hmm. So that could have been a belief that was guarding that. Now that also doesn't really happen on earth. It's supposed to happen in the divine realm. So it's also different in that regards. I guess I'd be looking at like the Lord's Supper and seeing eating his flesh and drinking his blood. While I know Passover plays a role in Jewish thought, I, I can't see just a single source playing a role here. And I, the, the Christians believe in some way this is um, participating in the death, or at least baptism is for sure, in the death, burial, resurrection. But the ingestion of the deity, uh, there's some magical thing happening here. And I can't see that not happening with Dionysus. Anyway, uh, mm -hmm. I imagine they believe this stuff was true. Yay, infamous. Thank you for the super chat. So it is three days later, or has it not happened yet? There's only one resurrection, right? So which is right when both go against numbers 2319? Another one about God not being a man. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I see a lot of people arguing this. So, I mean, I, th I think this is not a good argument when you could go from these verses in the Old Testament about God not being a man. I mean, to give an analogy, it's like if I met some ghosts and they said, follow me. And so I, I ran after them, but they went through a wall and I'd be like, I can't go through a wall like you guys. I'm not a dead person. Okay. I did not mean I'm never going to be a dead person. It could go through walls like the ghosts. I'm just saying right now. And the qualitative aspect of Deuteronomy or Numbers 23 is that God is not a man that he should lie. That what he's trying to say is I'm not like you men that lie. So don't treat me like that. I am distinct from you. I'm a different category. Who doesn't lie? That is not at all suggesting that God could never become a man. Uh, or he's just the focus of the, these verses are that he doesn't lie or he's not like humans in the way that we act and live and do things. Thank you so much. I'll try to lower how much commentary I have on these so we can get through them. Humanist Reformation uh, in March. Make sure you cover when the trumpet was sounded and all the nations mourned the coming of the Son of Man, Matthew 24. And when every man was repaid according to their deeds, Matthew 16, before those people mm -hmm. passed away. Yep. Yeah, I'm already on it. No worry. Thank you for such a huge support, Humanist. I appreciate that seriously. Keeps us alive. Uh, don't want to have to resurrect the channel. Um, I don't know if I believe it's possible uh, to resurrect. Well, Ken Hovind is trying. It's not working, though. Oh, I heard about that. That's a whole yeah, nother thing. <laughs> Addison says, thank you. And thank you for the super chat. Thank you for clarifying things, Derek. I'm sorry if I came across as hostile. No, not at all. Not, look, we're all having fun. Um, this is Michael loves the attention. I don't give him enough. Our relationship's not oh, that great. It's I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, joke around. All right, Jeff, thank you so much for the super chat. I need more characters. Yes, Bayes theorem can be used to argue that false resurrection claims are evidence against the truth of Jesus's resurrection. I don't think you can use Bayes theorem in that way. I agree with Tim O'Neill when he writes about this that you know you can. Richard Swinburne can use Bayes theorem to argue it's 98% likely Jesus rose from the dead. And Richard Carrier can use Bayes theorem to show that Jesus never existed. I mean, right. Bayes theorem is useful for when you have actual quantities. Like we can calculate the probability it's going to rain tomorrow because we can look at the, we actually can, we have all the days from last year uh, on which days it rains. We have an exact quantity of days it rained. When you have exact quantities, you can do Bayes theorem. When you're trying to calculate whether a person existed or whether, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, there's no exact quantities to plug in. So you end up making up the quantities based on your subjective preferences. Mm -hmm. As Tim O'Neill says, garbage in, garbage out. So I don't use the same with the McGrews, right? The McGrews do the, they're doing the same thing in other ways. With the, they, they do it a little different. I didn't, I didn't, but I still didn't entirely agree with it. No. Okay. 
Thank you, Jeff, for that super chat. Uh, Sentinel Apologetics is dropping bombshell sources oh, on snap. me. He's adding salt to the wounds. Thank you so much for that uh, super chat. I really appreciate it, Sentinel. Um, Jake Darling, why would God condemn other previous resurrections then copy their methods? True actions do not need cultural presuppositions to become true as literary fiction relies on. What? I mean, well, condemn, condemn uh, because if they didn't happen and then copy their methods, he didn't uh, because they didn't actually happen. And again, there was a qualitative difference between Jesus's resurrection and say like Osiris or like, you know, Inanna. They're not copies. I don't know of any scholar that would say they're copies. Yeah, I don't know if copy is the right term. Uh, if if we got rid of the Xerox copy idea and we understood these as analogous or even tropes or something, that might be different. But um, there's so much in that to unpack, though. Uh, thank you so much, Jake. Appreciate that. Jeff, aside, do you believe the evidence for Jesus's resurrection is as compelling as the evidence for the moon landing? Misleading analogy, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, analogies by definition are not perfect. And my analogy was more about not that they have the same level of evidence, but that how we're not going to dismiss either one just because there are fictional stories that have similar features in them. So I'm not comparing evidence. The point of my analogy was to compare the fact that you can find similar stories, but that doesn't mean one or the other is false. So it, it's not a misleading analogy because you have to take it in the context of how I used the analogy. And yes, there's more evidence for the moon landing. I'm not going to deny that. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. William Becker, IP uses less ad hoc when evaluating resurrection arguments. Does he also use that when harmonizing Judas's death? Yeah. I need to look more into that, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, William. Uh, tons of mice. I have reservations in hell. A nice seat by the fire. Stop by. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, tons of mice, for the super chat. Uh, Cheryl, thank you for the super chat. IP, you continue to use the words historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. What is your historical evidence without using other scholars' opinions? So, again, I would lay out the, most of what I laid out in my resurrection series. We have early reports. Um, Paula Fredrickson says, I mean, they must have seen something. So we have early reports. We have skeptics convert. I think we have sufficient evidence for the early tomb. Um, embarrassing features that I would use as secondary evidence. Uh, willing to accept persecution, like Peter, Paul, James, the just, these kinds of things. Uh, immediate proclamation in Jerusalem. Um, other issues like that as well. And then the question then becomes, how do we explain all of this? It's about comparing different theories. Which theory is going to be the least ad hoc? So that's, you know, it's, it's like when people were not sure what happened to King Tut. Uh, did, was he assassinated? Did he die of natural causes? You evaluate all the evidence and you go, which theory is going to make the most sense with the data that's going to be the simplest? So I would use a same, similar kind of tactic. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate the super chat. Thank you, Michael, for taking these. And the Christians have taken myth vision from the pagans, I see. <laughs> Thank you so much, Captain. Captain Dad pull for the super. Um, almost done here, Michael. Um, Yakub Muhammad, is the Islamic Jesus closer to history a prophet? So obviously yeah, Michael no. would say no. Um, no, well, also, they argue that Jesus didn't even die on the cross. So, I mean, right. like, Bart Ehrman so would say that he agrees. You know, it's like, yeah, not all Muslims do. Not all Muslims do. But there's a good amount that do. And so with them on that point, I disagree, right? Um, as far as dropping Jesus down, this is the problem, is there are certain titles that they give to Jesus that you could tell it's missing its first century context, they yeah. call them certain things, and and yet it's kind of got a new context, but they're using the same terms. And I'm like, hold on, I, I can't put my finger on. But if Jesus is not divine in their perspective, they still think he did miracles and stuff. So it's tough for me to just say, yeah, I think it's closer to history. But if we're getting closer to a a human, um, I guess you'd say that would be going that direction for me. But it still I mean, has him doing things, you know. And they also borrowed from the infancy gospel of Thomas, which, you know, yep. is just, we know is, you know, a late forgery. So, I mean, like, there's just a lot of problems there. I mean, even if you could convince me Christianity is false, I mean, the last thing I do is become a Muslim because there's no way to intellectually argue against the crucifixion of Jesus. It's just the historical evidence is just there. Thank you. Thank you. Imnag, 2,000 years and no verifiable evidence of any resurrection. 2,000 minus 6,000 years. These stories existed all over the place. These stories were common. The Jesus resurrection story was just another of the same with a few differences. 
Yeah, I don't agree, but I don't have time to go into all the details. We've covered a lot of them here. Yeah, so I appreciate this massive super chat. Seriously, appreciate the love and the support. Um, yeah, there's so many little details that, that you know we can get into on that, but I really appreciate it. William Becker says, how is the rope snapped harmonization for Judas's death not completely ad hoc? Well, I mean, we'd have to look at what they say. I don't know if I even said that was the only approach to it. I mean, I could say that one is actually a literary uh, way to account for things. Uh, again, it's a, it's not something I've actually had time to look at lately. I need to go back and read and read what the scholars have said, so I can't comment on it right now. So, I mean, you got to, you know, just can't answer every super chat off the cuff if I'm not actually. I think you have to know it. right now, man. <laughs> it's have to know right now. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, thank like, you, William. People try. Appreciate that. And yeah, looking forward to seeing what you have to say on that, Michael. Bro Joe, thank you for the super chat. Back in the day, we would stand for hours, even overnight, to get tickets to our favorite band. Where were the hundreds of followers eagerly waiting AT, the tomb, for his prophesied resurrection? Well, I mean, they, the Gospels report that they were hiding because they didn't want to end up dead as well. Uh, and they weren't actually expecting it because they didn't understand the prophecies or what Jesus was talking about. They they were so caught up in the Jewish expectation of a conquering Messiah, they missed what Jesus was trying to say, and they didn't understand what he meant until he rose and then revealed in re the scriptures to them as what he was trying to do all along. So that's the argument, is that they were basically hiding because they didn't think it was going to happen. Thank you, Brojo. I really appreciate that. We've caught up. Michael, I want to give you not only a chance to say um, as we're exiting what you would recommend for people who are curious or interested in your side of things. Are there certain books that you highly recommend that have influenced your perception and how you view this? And then I'll Yeah, I'll give I mean, I, I think I like uh, uh, Michael Kona's book, The Resurrection, on the resurrection of Jesus. I, I like his approach in there, and that's the approach I've taken on his um my favorite thing about the book is this is historical approach. He has, sets out a very good historical methodology, which I think and I've tried to follow as well. So that's what I would recommend for that. And you know, I don't even entirely agree with the whole minimal facts approach, but I like the methodology he used in there. And so I'd mm. recommend that's a great starting place. Would it be um, fair to say um, these books that are listed, if I'm sharing my screen properly, um, these are books yeah. that you would highly recommend. If anyone wants to take your side seriously and investigate, this would be the list of books. Yeah. I mean, and I don't agree with everything in these books, but I think they're good. I think there's, there's issues I have along the lines, but I mean, mm -hmm. I think that these are a good place to start. Okay. Well, I really appreciate that. I would obviously just to throw a little jab. If you keep watching Myth Vision, you're going to keep hearing from scholars that we have on. Um, eventually Richard A. Miller is going to come on Richard C. Miller. Sorry. Richard C. Miller's coming on. We're going to do that. And I hope to get a course with him. You know, Dennis McDonald, I do think it's worth considering the Mimesis approach. Various scholars. In any of the scholars that he has listed, there are scholars who write critical of those uh, scholars. Jeff Wright on Richard Bauckham, N.T. Wright, go to Paula Fredrickson mm -hmm. and John J. Collins, and like different people with different things. And then listen to their critique of the other side and understand the, the arguments. So, Michael, thank you. Um, what should I dress for our date later? What should I wear? Oh, you're wearing lipstick again. Okay. Dang it. <laughs> All right. Well, I love you. Thank you. Hit the like button, share this out and look two totally different positions. We can come and talk about this. And uh, I think we should set examples to do that more often. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate you. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more.